Drumtopia. I am your intrepid, incorrigible, humble, and mildly eccentric host, Mr. Zeppo. Thanks for listening to my crazy show. I'm the first one to, to admit that uh, some of the things I talk about are a little wacky, but they are well intended and hopefully um, uh, clearly anchored in love and compassion for the entire human species. So, anyways, I'm back, and the goal is to live up to the original title of the show, or at least the first couple of words of it, almost daily. I want to be on the airwaves as often as possible, and I want you guys to join me in discussing what's going on in the world. And that means I need your comments. I need your. I need you to email me at the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo at gmail.com. Send those tweets at me at Mr. Zeppo, etc., etc., etc. And I'm also looking for individuals who want to talk live in the podcast. So if you want to be interviewed, if you've got an important thing to say, let me know. And I'm one of those people that's, I'm an inclusionist. Is that a word? Did I just make up a word? I'm a coexist believer. I'm a believer in coexisting. Um, so my show is not about telling people what I believe, but rather asking and sharing what we all think about what's going on. Um, asking each other and sharing with each other about all of it. And then, you know, trying to see if maybe, just maybe... There isn't some important truth that's out there that we all could maybe rally around. Uh, and yeah, I have opinions about that. This is an opinion show, etc., etc. For those of you who might be joining the show and are relatively new, um, and you have opinions about the media and whether or not it's reliable or not, I've commented plenty on my position on that there. Um, I'll let you uh, take the time to find those episodes, but I'll leave you with this to sort of maybe answer your question, I don't watch any media with blind faith. And I don't subscribe to any one particular brand. And I used to be a brand person. In other words, you know, like, I've, I, I'm aware of the concerns about media. I'm also clearly aware that there are genuine people uh, inside the monsters trying to do good work. So, anyways... But let's let's really hone in on something that has been covered intensely in, in the media, although it is quite curious to note how differently each little sub-demographic has been covering it. But uh, And Fox News has not touched on this too, as intensely as other channels has, but um, let's, let's hone in on this one thing about this whole episode. There has been no known paperwork generated at the separation of child from family. Now, that may seem like a meaningless detail, but as, as it has been touted in the left uh, media, and it, they're hammering the administration for this, there's no back-end plan for reuniting the kids that are being removed or, uh, you know, separated from their parents. As of the moment that Jeff Sessions announced the zero tolerance policy, we went, this country, the, the Trump administration, went from, you know, inheriting a weird and messed up and not very great system of immigration control and deportation. No disagreement here. The immigration system has, for a very, very, very long time, been dysfunctional. Broken, perhaps. That's a bit of a strong statement, because people still get to come and go. Um, we, people still got deported. So it's not like it wasn't working at all. And, and it, the exaggeration from the right of, the, uh, of Democrats wanting open borders, that's ridiculous. That's an extremist point of view that's about demagoguery and us versus themness. Okay? And same thing on the other side. All of that is madness. But the zero tolerance policy, when it kicked into effect, we transitioned, folks. We, we crossed a line. That's my point. That's what I'm trying to get at here with this opening statement. 
We crossed a line. And I say we because blaming one person or one group of people is ineffective and doesn't achieve anything. Are we or are we not we the people of America? Well, we may have just recently replaced America with Trumptopia unofficially, but it's still we the people, I think. That means we have a responsibility to create the change we want to see. And obviously more and more people are realizing just uh, just yesterday, with a bit of silver lining, the mayor of New York said, if the federal government's not going to make an effort to fix this horrible wrong it has committed, then it is up to us, city by city, up to us, the people, the citizens of this country, to restore this injustice, to return those kids to those parents and provide for them as Asylum seekers, the due process of reviewing their asylum request and of either granting them asylum or not. It's not that tough. Now, sidebar. Um, There's a lot of debate going on about whether or not this is the correct way to approach the, quote, immigration problem. Let me tell you what I think this actually is. This is actually an intensifying of the xenophobic rhetoric, the anti-immigration rhetoric, that has always been there in the extreme right, long before Trump himself. And this is an advancing of that agenda, which is not original to Trump himself. He's just taking advantage of it now that he's in the limelight. Um, And he's turning it into quite a spectacle, a dog and pony show, to further divide the American public. but And there's a lot of sort of interesting tactics going on here, one of which is the criminalization of regular migration, legal immigration is being criminalized, um, as well as asylum seeking, okay? Well, I think asylum seeking uh, is the, the main one getting the hit right now. I think... They're going to try and they're already openly speaking of limiting, minimizing and or otherwise shrinking our this country's um, yearly immigration intake. Now, curiously, someone pointed out, and forgive me, I don't have his name. I don't, didn't have time to take note. It was something I was slipping through while having brunch, I think. But it, it's an interesting observation. And it was on a panel discussion. And this gentleman points out that people of European, Caucasian, white descent who are fleeing um, other hotspots or other situations of, um, that, that of urgent, you know, like threat, personal threat, and asking for asylum here in the United States have been processed without any hubbub, without any calamity, without any craziness. They've been processed, admitted, welcomed, and resettled into the United States freely and without any kind of like, oh, you're a threat to our national security. Whereas these people down south coming up from uh, Latin American countries that are being ravished by situations that were in part, not wholly, but in part, created or made into into being by this country and past uh, government actions. Um, they're, so these people are fleeing and they're seeking asylum. They are refugees uh, and they're seeking asylum here. And this craziness is being enforced. When you compare side by side, the children being ripped away from their parents and then white folk who need, who are also refugees seeking asylum, just being welcomed in with open arms and resettled without any kind of static or drama or suspicion uh, or hate being thrown their way. I mean, what what other conclusion can be drawn other than underneath everything, underneath everything, there's a deep, deep seated xenophobia, and hypocrisy, which together breeds racism and white supremacy. Now let's zoom back. This is a nation established by foreigners 
let me expound on this for a hot second and then get back to the children of the issue of, uh, of the history and how that relates to these children. We're, we're literally kidnapping from parents. People from far away who came here to this land, which was occupied at that time by other people who themselves would have seen themselves and probably did consider themselves as the locals, the natives, the people who are here. The founding fathers immigrated here from other places. The, the, the 13 colonies were businesses launched by foreign corporations. Let's remember that. And the, the bloody, violent birth of this nation, I'm sorry, I don't have more eloquent ways of phrasing this, but at the center of that was the, the stealing of this land from those that lived here prior, before, uh, you know, the, the invasion, before the infestation of colonists and corporate um, profiteers from um, predominantly white European uh, empire-type nations. Now, someone curiously posted the question. Now, there was an interesting post I saw on social media today questioning... I can't remember the wording right now, and I don't have my computer on, so I can't look it up. But it basically was questioning the assumption that the Native Americans were truly indigenous and native... And could they not have invaded and taken this place, this land, from other peoples before them? That's not impossible. And it's an interesting question of curiosity. Obviously, related to this whole fiasco, this kidnapping catastrophe on the border, but in a very kind of erudite and advanced, sort of like three steps ahead of the logic, someone, I can't remember quite who, but I, this, this sentence stands out. I'm sure I'm butchering the exact wording, and I will try to look it up later and include it in a future episode for clarity. But a, a Facebook acquaintance of mine posted something along the lines of, who's to say the Native Americans didn't take this land away from someone else? Why do we presume that they were the originals? They came from somewhere else too, right? And they did. Historically speaking, genetically speaking, science has been able to measure and verify that whoever... Um, whatever they may have been calling themselves at the time, the people that we call the Native Americans, um, which is a sad, tragic, sarcastic, and dismissive and belittling uh, label that we applied to them. And I say we in the royal sense. We as everybody who considers themselves American must take responsibility for the history of this great nation or else it, it, it is bound to really, truly become Trumptopia. But fundamentally, when it comes to the issue of uh, the here and now and the present sort of circumstances that we're facing and this really uh, in disingenuous um, emergency, this, this fabricated uh, humanitarian um, situation at the border where these families are being ripped apart, there's got to be something deeper and crazier going on um, because as a deterrent... It clearly wasn't going to be very effective. And any kind of deterrent device, you need to let it work itself out. You need to let it roll, right? Like, this deterrence was was only really heavily in place for how many weeks? And then this crazy rollback, which, by the way, classic to Trump doesn't actually solve anything, doesn't actually roll anything back. And although Trump signed a, a presidential decree supposedly ending the practice, I have little faith that that, act, that, 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 that memo, in effect, because I don't think it was, I don't even think it qualified um, as an official uh, presidential executive order, that memo is so full of loopholes and so full of open-ended ways of, like, what? Of, you know, how are you going to interpret that? And such a lack of clarity and a lack of legal guidance in it um, that I don't have any faith or trust in this administration that the separation and disappearing of children will actually cease. 
And in fact, like I was saying in, in one recent attempt to record this episode, I'm convinced that everything President Trump does is about pushing the pendulum further to the extreme right to see how much we'll tolerate. Which includes, mind you, a pendulum cannot... A pendulum must swing both ways. It cannot only swing to the right. Right now, what he's trying to do is build momentum to see what new height it can get to before letting it naturally return back towards the left. And then the left side will have its chance to try to push that. Um, but let me digress. The, the deep irony of all the victories that, that President Trump claims is that when you really start to pry them open, there's not a lot there. Uh, I, I wanted to address the summit in North Korea, which is something that was happening and building to its crazy climax right when I was beginning to consider coming off my hiatus. And I sat through that, watched the news through that, not, not, not coming on the air and recording any podcast episodes. And, and now this whole, uh, uh, climax with, with the, I'm trying to, no one's gotten a good word for it. But I think kidnapping, it's the kidnapping debacle. Catastrophe. What's an alliteration? I'm looking for alliteration. The kidnapping... Well, anyways, that, that's nonsensical. This situation here with families being separated, brutally separated, and kids being incarcerated and detained in, in Gitmo-like situations, although that, that's an unfair comparison. The, the parallels between the summit and this signing of this of this presidential decree are are interesting. The buildup was sort of self, uh, like he 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 creates this tension that didn't exist before, and then he throws all these insults around, and then all, and then he muddies the water, and then he has his surrogates say different things from what he's going with, and then suddenly he he declares that he's solved a problem that no one's really quite figured out yet. And, in fact, leaves the world with a deeper, more complex problem than we could have imagined before. The North Korea-South Korea thing is not solved. We are not f in an era of denuclearized North Korea Peninsula, okay? Um, and this separating of, of families at the border is not solved because it's just a symptom. Both of these things are symptomologies of deeper corruption and deeper issues, as I talk about um, in past episodes and we'll talk about in future episodes, I'm sure. How much longer will it take, do you think, before the separations actually stop, before children are reunited with their parents, before children are no longer disappearing to the four corners of the country without any paperwork, without being tracked, without any documents saying this kid and this family in this locations, you know, like nothing. Uh, and that's the part that's really hard to believe which is astounding. But based on what I've been able to, uh, through comparing and, and, and contrasting the difference, you know, reporting on it out there, because, uh, you know, grain of salt, the, the media is not to be blindly trusted, um, right? Uh, but uh, this is a mess that is deeply traumatic on many levels and that is really overwhelming. And it's very, very easy to get lost down the rabbit hole of pointing fingers, of laying blame, all the typical ego traps that get in the way of finding true solutions. Um, and what I like to point out is that this is nothing new. You know, Japanese internment camps, I mean, do you think that slave families back in the 13 colony days and in the, the pro-slavery era were kept together? No. Slaves were bought and sold like commodities, and no one cared for family ties. In fact, you wanted to mix it up so that because then you could make more. Slave owners ha handled slaves like livestock, and that's well. I mean, that's a kind of depravity and dehumanization of others and of self, mind you, that never really went away. It just curled up and hid in dark recesses and is now making an effort to become mainstream again. This antagonizing and abusive traumatizing of brown-skinned families under the excuse of national security, under the, the, the scapegoating of 
all the dumb, stupid things that he said. We don't need to, you know, relitigate all those horrible labels and um, and in, incorrect uh, associations to gang um, violence and all that kind of stuff. People come here for a lot of reasons. And yes, violent people come here because human beings are human beings. Okay. But the way he vilifies and dehumanizes immigrants from countries where the majority population are not white skinned, it's patently obvious the agenda, the true agenda there is not really uh, solving the immigration crisis as we've called it for the last 30 years but rather to create chaos, instill fear, cause conflict, and further distract uh, the voting public through anger and, and burnout. I'll leave you with that thought. And as always, my friends, as always, I pray that peace, love, and grooviness blossoms in your heart. That you may not be so outraged by what's going on that you cannot find your way back to that peace, love, and grooviness in your heart. Because those are the tools we're going to need as the fight gets worse, as the days get darker, as the oppression gets more tyrannical, and as our resistance becomes more important we must be anchored, not in hate, but in love. We must be rooted, not in destruction, but in compassion. We must be motivated, not by retribution or revenge, but by healing and transcending these problems that we created for ourselves. Thank you for listening. I am your ever humble, if only slightly wacky host, the incorrigible Mr. Seppo.